Um, but I wanted to ask you to begin, since uh, you were here last year, you were at EFRI's uh, World Policy Conference last year. Uh, take us through the past year in terms of cooperation and competition in the space area by the international community. In which direction are we moving? And can you also then go back a decade and tell us what have been the major changes in space? In fact, uh, since uh, last year, uh, we had uh, a number of uh, changes because of uh, what is made in the US. Because uh, in space, uh, you have uh, six uh, large space powers, uh, the US, China, Europe, Japan, Russia, and India. But uh, the US are definitely the biggest space power. And uh, last year, uh, a new administrator has been appointed at NASA, Jim Rodenstein. And uh, the Trump administration tried to change a number of points in the US space policy. And I would like to insist on two points, which are, in my opinion, quite important. The first one, a new interest to go to the moon, but to go to the moon, not to come back to the moon, because you probably saw the uh, many movies uh, existing on the moon, uh, which uh, the, with the, the, the moon landing uh, 50 years ago, the last one is the first man, it's a very good movie. But uh, the idea is uh, to come back to the moon, but with private initiative. And this is why NASA is now contemplating uh, what is so-called deep space gateway with uh, private companies which could be interested in go, coming back to the moon. So this is the first point, moon. And the second point, uh, you know that uh, in the US today there are six uh, uh, forces in the army, uh, which are uh, the US Air Force, the US Navy, US Army, uh, the Coast Guards and the Marines, and so, uh, five today. And so uh, President Trump wants uh, to add a sixth one. It's a view because, in fact, uh, the U.S. are very uh, active in the field of uh, defense systems uh, which are developed for space. Uh, we have a budget for NASA which is uh, 20 billion dollars, a budget for the DOD which is roughly the same, 20 billion dollars. But there is obviously a political will of President Trump to create a sixth force, and we will see if he does it. And these are. These two uh, very, uh, let us say, important factors which are uh, today shaping the new uh, landscape of uh, space policy worldwide. And do they affect the ability to cooperate by the international community? For the moon, it is clear that uh, we will have uh, probably the follow-up of the International Space Station, but uh, on the International Space Station today, uh, we have uh, the US, Russia, Europe, Japan, and Canada, and two uh, space rovers are not in the station, India and China. And the big question mark is, uh, are we going to see China and India being a part of uh, the back to the moon? It's an open question. There are pros, there are cons. It is clear that uh, it's a project which will be very, very expensive. China uh, this year will be probably the space power with uh, the biggest number of launches, more than 30 this year. And so there is a question mark, but in the same time, you know better than me uh, the relationship between uh, the US and China, which is not so easy. But uh, this is an open question for international cooperation. And it is clear that uh, if we have now a sixth force for a defense, it will open also a number of new issues and probably it will uh, reinforce the will of other space powers to have also a military uh, space program. Tell us a little bit about Russia's space program these days. Uh, how important is it? Russian space program is uh, quite important. Uh, they have uh, fantastic heritage. But uh, as a matter of fact, uh, they are suffering uh, technical difficulties. Uh, you probably saw what happened two weeks ago when uh, a Russian cosmonaut and a US astronaut tried to go to the space station. And uh, after uh, 90 uh, seconds in the flight, uh, they were obliged to eject, to jettison the uh, Soyuz capsule and uh, to come back with a parachute because there was a malfunction in the Soyuz launch vehicle. And there are a number of uh, quality issues in Russia. Could you talk now a little bit about uh, this incredible amount of data that is assembled by the uh, space satellite system? Uh, who owns this data? What happens to it? Um, 
and how important is it to the world economy today? In fact, uh, the question of data is absolutely crucial because uh, we have uh, more and more satellites sending more and more data. And so they transmit data for telecommunications, but uh, this point is uh, not really an issue. What is an issue is uh, what to do with the data related to Earth observation, and in particular, uh, data related to uh, observing uh, climate change. And uh, there are uh, two options which are on the table. There are some countries uh, which say that this data must be proprietary and uh, stay uh, in the country which uh, owns the satellite. And some other countries, and this is the case of France and Europe, which have an open data policy. And I think, personally, I think that it is uh, the uh, right option because uh, with all these satellites, we have today uh, two points which are at stake. The first one, to have a kind of standardization of data, because when you observe the Earth, if you don't observe exactly the same data, uh, you will have a dispute between China and the US when uh, the US will say to China, uh, you pollute a lot, we have a lot of uh, uh, greenhouse effect gases, and uh, China will not accept, and so we need to standardize the data, and this is what we are doing now, and after that, this data uh, must be in open policy and in my opinion it's quite important because it has a very strong political effect and it creates also a number of startups which uh, will use this data, which will develop new models and I am sure that uh, the future of space is probably uh, relying upon an open data policy. And when you say that we're moving to standardized data right now, Explain to us what that means. What is standardizing? For instance, if uh, you uh, observe uh, the concentrations in the atmosphere of uh, carbon dioxide, there are many uh, possibilities to observe these concentrations for, from space. You could measure the height of a kind of a virtual colon with carbon dioxide. You can describe clouds and so on. But if you don't observe exactly the same data, you will have a lot of debates between scientists. And this is why we are now preparing, and I hope we will be uh, able to sign this chart in, uh, during the next uh, One Planet Summit organized by President Macron. The first one happened in uh, December 2017 in Paris. The second one last September in New York City. And the next one is planned for uh, Nairobi next March. And I hope that in Nairobi, we'll be able to uh, sign a charter defining exactly which data should be observed in order to have this open data policy. And can you explain a little bit more about this forum where uh, this will be discussed? Is it, uh, does it have any private sector companies that are members or have a, a way to put input into? Yes, of course, uh, we have uh, a system with uh, satellites which are owned by the government, but after that, the use of data is made by private companies, and uh, these private companies uh, use uh, this uh, data, which are free, and uh, with this data, they will create uh, uh, value because, in fact, uh, we have to consider this data as a kind of infrastructure which is provided by the government. Since we're sitting here on the shoulder of Africa, tell us a little bit about Africa's role in space. Africa now uh, is opening the space chapter because uh, until 10 years ago, uh, there was uh, a very small uh, number of uh, space powers for a very simple reason. Owning a satellite was immediately uh, several uh, hundred million of dollars. And now because of the uh, digitalization, because of the miniaturization, the cost of the satellites is decreasing very, very strongly, and you have more and more countries which have a space program. Ten years ago, we had six big space agencies. Today, we have 60, ten times more. And so, in Africa, Africa was out of space until a few years ago, and now you have a space program in Algeria, in Kenya, in Egypt, and uh, probably uh, the most important, this is here in Morocco, because Morocco decided to buy two very smart uh, Earth observation satellites to help uh, to uh, manage the development of Morocco. We launched the first one last year from French Guiana, and uh, the first one is uh, so-called Mohamed 6A, and the next one, 
Mohamed 6B will be launched on 20th of November from uh, French Guiana as well. But there are very, very uh, smart satellites uh, which uh, are manufactured in France. And this is what we used to call the African chapter because uh, now Africa is uh, using more and more data for its development. Mm -hmm. uh, the United States in announcing the Space Command emphasized, our Vice President Pence certainly emphasized, uh, his desire uh, to maintain the superiority in military, the military realm in space that the United States has today, he says, on Earth. Is that a realistic objective? Is it a, uh, an objective that we should wish uh, happens? I think that it is a realistic objective. I am not sure that uh, it will be at the end uh, what is described today, but uh, we had this situation uh, 30 years ago uh, when President Reagan uh, decided to develop a Star Wars and uh, there were a number of projects which finally didn't exist, but uh, the consequence has been that uh, the federal budget injected a lot of money in the uh, US space industry and uh, it strengthened considerably the US space industry. And I, no, I think that nobody knows what will be, at the end of the day, the consequence of the decision of uh, President Trump, but everybody knows that uh, it will reinforce considerably the US space industry. Uh, for my last question before I throw you to the audience um, and appeal to their mercy, uh, talk a little bit about commercial travel uh, in space, how uh, Elon Musk is doing, how Jeff Bezos is doing, uh, what, uh, what are the patterns developing in commercial space travel? To be uh, very honest, uh, I have a lot of dubs for the next 10 or 20 years about uh, space travel because uh, we cannot be, all of us here, we cannot be astronauts. When uh, you go into space, after uh, eight minutes of uh, very strong uh, gravity, you are in zero gravity and most of people are immediately sick and it's very, very difficult. And uh, there are some projects, for instance, from Elon Musk with uh, the big Falcon rocket, when they said that uh, they could go from Paris to New York in 30 minutes, okay, it can be done, but uh, it will not be at all as in the jetliner because it will be 30 minutes in zero gravity, so it means that uh, after uh, a few minutes, uh, most of the people will be sick. And so I think that uh, it will not happen in the coming years. After that, perhaps that after 20 or 30 years, we will find the specific devices to create artificial gravity or something like that, but uh, in a nutshell, in my opinion, it is not for tomorrow. And uh, Europe, should Europe aspire to a role in commercial travel in space? We have a number of projects in Europe, but frankly speaking, uh, there are a lot of projects in the US, in other countries, uh, but today uh, these are only uh, futuristic projects, and uh, I do not see uh, space travel for the next 10 or 20 years. And what about uh, travel on Earth? that uh, we talked about last year some in our panel on uh, the interconnected nature of uh, the internet uh, and uh, there was discussion of the ability of people in Sao Paulo to telephone for a uh, not necessarily a spacecraft but a high altitude vehicle. How is that developing? In fact, uh, we have also a number of uh, projects uh, which uh, exist, but uh, during uh, the last year we had a kind of uh, strengthening of uh, some projects. We spoke last year about uh, Galileo. Uh, Galileo last year we had uh, 50 uh, million users, now we are at more than 500 million. And for a very simple reason is that the ships which uh, are on the smartphone, are now equipped uh, with Galileo worldwide. And so it means that every time someone buys a smartphone, is a new user of Galileo, because Galileo is 10 times more uh, uh, accurate than the GPS, and your smartphone chooses by itself the best accuracy. And so uh, 
one or two years ago, everyone was connected to the GPS, and in three years from now, everyone will be connected to Galileo, and uh, it will be uh, the, reali uh, the, the reality of what I said last year, because when we started uh, to speak uh, about uh, Galileo, a lot of people told me uh, that uh, Galileo is the European GPS, and I answered that in three years, we will say that uh, GPS is the US Galileo, and I am sure that it will be the case. <laughs> Very good.